a telephone conversation between a receptionist who works at a house renting agency and a man. First, you'll have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, how can I help you today? Ah, yes, hello. I'm just phoning you as I have seen an advertisement on your website for a property that I'm interested in renting. If possible, I'd like to find out some more information before I organise a viewing. No problem at all. What is the address of the property that you'd like to inquire about? It's 21 North Avenue. OK, what is it that you'd like to know? First of all, I'd like to know what facilities the office has, as I need to make sure that it'll be suitable for my advertising company. I see. The office contains a large open plan space with a wide frontage onto a busy street with lots of passers-by, so your business would have a really good street presence. There is also a toilet and newly refurbished kitchen equipped with a dishwasher and oven. Wow, that sounds great. I'd definitely like to register my interest. OK, perfect. I just need to take some details from you, if that's OK. What is your full name? Jonathan Smith. And what position do you hold in your company, Jonathan? Until recently I was sales manager. However, I've recently been promoted to regional manager, so I'll be in charge of running our new office. Can I ask where the office is located? Yes, of course. It's located downtown just around the corner from Royal Square Shopping Centre. Hmm, that's a bit too far out of the centre for my liking. I'd much prefer to be located in close proximity to the station. Do you have any property located in that vicinity? It would help me to narrow down the results if you could tell me how many employees you intend to have working in the office. Our branch is made up of 30 employees, and we'd like some extra space for meetings and presentations. Most average office spaces are around 8,000 square feet, but it sounds like you would need more space than that. I think that 10,000 square feet would be more suitable for your needs. Now, let's see, we have 10 properties that match those criteria, so let's try and narrow it down. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Do you have any other requirements? Well, we'll need access to the office 12 hours a day, but security should be 24 hour. We don't hold any money on the premises, but it's crucial that we protect our customer information against theft. OK, anything else? Yes, ideally I would prefer the new office to be split over two levels, so that the working office area is kept separate from street level. That will enable us to locate a reception at ground floor level to welcome customers when they arrive. And are there any particular facilities that you need? Our employees work very hard throughout the day, and I want to make sure that they're well nourished. It would therefore be ideal if I could provide them with a kitchen to cook hot meals at lunchtime. Would you want the kitchen to be located at first floor level with the office? No, I don't want the office to be filled with the smell of food. It would be better if the new office had a basement where we could locate the kitchen and staff room area to keep it at arm's length from the workspace. OK, I have now narrowed the search to two available properties. Do you have any other requirements that could narrow our search down to one result? All of our office staff will be working at desktop computers so I'll need the office to be equipped with at least 40 power sockets, if possible. Anything else? 
Studies have shown that exercise is very important for maintaining happiness and healthy brain function. In an office environment, it's very difficult to get sufficient daily exercise, so it would be great if they had access to a nearby exercise area. One of the available offices is located next door to a gym. Would this be suitable? Yes, absolutely. A gym is exactly what I was thinking of. Brilliant. Do you need the office to be furnished? I don't think so. I already have some furniture, so I would prefer to bring this myself. That's no problem at all. Ah, uh, and before I forget, we will definitely require Wi-Fi access, as much of our work and customer recruitment is carried out online. No problem. It sounds like the property will suit your needs perfectly. I've taken the liberty of booking you a viewing at 3pm on Thursday, so you can see it for yourself. Is there anything else I can help you with today? No, I think that's all the information I need. Thanks very much for your help. No problem. It's been my pleasure to be of assistance. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a trainee teacher called Eve talking to her university tutor about her preparations for teaching practice. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, Eve. Come in and sit down. How's it going? Fine, thanks. I'm looking forward to my teaching practice next week. Good. Now, you've got two classes, haven't you? Year 3 and Year 6. Have you done your lesson plans? Well, I've decided to take the topic of renewable energy I haven't done a lesson plan for Year 6 yet, but I thought I'd base their lesson on an example of very simple technology. So, I've brought this diagram to show you. I got it from the internet. Let's see. A biogas plant. So, this is equipment for producing fuel from organic waste? Yes. The smaller container on the left is where you put the waste you've collected. Right, and from there it's piped into the larger tank. That's right, and that's slurry on the base of the larger tank. Right, and what exactly is slurry? It's a mixture of organic waste and water. So is that pipe at the bottom where the water comes in? Yes, it is. As the slurry mixture digests, it produces gas, and that rises to the top of the dome. Then, when it's needed, it can be piped off for use as fuel in homes or factories. It's very simple. I suppose there's some kind of safety valve to prevent pressure build-up? That's the overflow tank. That container on the right. As the slurry expands, some of it flows into that. And then, once some of the gas has been piped off, the slurry level goes down again, and the overflow tank empties again. I see. Well, I think that's suitably simple for the age level it's for. I look forward to seeing the whole lesson plan. Thanks. And can I show you my ideas for the Year 3 lesson? Of course. Let's... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. I thought I'd introduce the topic by writing the word energy on the board and reinforcing the spelling and the pronunciation. Then I'll do a little mime, you know, run on the spot or something, to convey the sense. I'd keep it brief at this stage. Yes, I will. Then I'll wipe the word off and write the question, where does energy come from, and see what the pupils come up with. Fine. I'd suggest that you just brainstorm at this stage and don't reject any of their suggestions. Yes, that's what I was going to do. Then I've produced a set of simple statements like energy makes cars move along the road and energy makes our bodies grow. There are eight altogether. Are you going to give them out as a handout or write them up on the board? First, write them up on the board and then I'll read them out loud and I'll get the pupils to copy them out in their notebooks. I'll also ask them to think up one more similar statement by themselves and add it to the list. Good idea. After that, I thought I'd vary things a bit by sticking some pictures up. Of things like the sun and plants and food and petrol and a running child. And I'll get the pupils to work out what order the pictures should come in, in terms of the energy chain. I think that's a very good idea. You could move the pictures around as the pupils give you directions. Yes, I think they'd enjoy that. And to finish off, I've made a gap fill exercise to give out. They'll be doing that individually, and while they're writing, I'll walk round and check their work. Good. And have you worked out the timing of all that? It'll probably take you right through to the end of the lesson. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a business student called Marco and his personal tutor about the courses that Marco should take. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23 on page 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi Marco, come in. Thanks. I've got a bit stuck trying to select courses for next semester. Could you help me please? Of course. Sit down. Oh. First of all, most people just go for the areas of business that they're interested in. But even if something doesn't look very stimulating, it's important that you can use it once you get a job. It's not much good choosing areas that aren't going to be helpful later on. Right. I want to go into management, so I'll need to think about that. And should I start specialising in a particular area yet? I don't think that's wise at this stage. It's better to aim for a wide variety of subjects, especially as management covers so many possibilities. You shouldn't be limiting your choices for later on. Yes, I see. You should also look at how the course is made up. Will you have regular seminars and tutorials, for example, as well as lectures? OK. Some of the lecturers are quite big names in their fields, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Should I aim to go to their courses? Well, remember that the lecturers who aren't well-known may still be very good teachers. I'd say we have a consistently high standard of teaching in this department, so you don't need to worry about it. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30 
on pages 5 and 6. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Good. Well, that's a great help. Now, last time we met, you mentioned doing team management, didn't you? That's right. I'm still quite keen on the idea. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that because of changes in the content of various courses, team management overlaps with the Introduction to Management course you took in your first year. Oh. So what you learned from it would be too little for the amount of time you'd have to spend on it. I'll drop that idea then. Have you had a chance to look at the outline I wrote for my finance dissertation? I left it in your pigeonhole last week. Yes. Why exactly do you want to write a dissertation instead of taking the finance modules? It'll be pretty demanding. Well, I'm quite prepared to do the extra work because I'm keen to investigate something in depth instead of just skating across the surface. I realise that a broader knowledge base may be more useful to my career, but I'm really keen to do this. Hmm, right. Well, I had a quick look through your outline, and the first thing that struck me was that you'll have to be careful how you set about it, as the way you've organised it seems unnecessarily complex. The data that you want to collect and analyse is potentially valuable, but you'll need to narrow down the subject matter to make the whole thing manageable. OK. I'll have another look at it. I was talking to Professor Briggs about it yesterday, and I got some more ideas then. For part of the dissertation, I was thinking of trying to persuade finance managers from three or four companies to let me ask them about their company finances. Mm -hmm. If not, I think I'll have to change to another topic. Well, go ahead then. I could give you some names. Thanks. Now, let's talk about practicalities. Your dissertation must be finalised by the end of May, so you should aim to finish the first draft by the end of March. Is that feasible? Yes, it shouldn't be a problem. I'll need to register for the dissertation, won't I? Is that with the registrar's department? No, it's internal to this department, so you just need to let the secretary know. Do that as soon as you're sure you're going to write the dissertation. OK. Then, to analyse your statistics, you're going to need some suitable software. If I were you, I'd drop into the computer office and ask them for a copy. Right. So, if I revise my outline... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on ecology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Carey, who will talk about the programme 
in restoration ecology. Thanks, Chris. A lot of people think that human beings can do whatever they want to the environment. But as Aldo Leopold taught, land is a system of interdependent parts which should be regarded as a community and not a commodity. Well, that idea has influenced what we teach here in our program, where students come from all over the world to learn about restoring native plant communities back into an ecologically natural state. This field is therefore a combination of formal science with practical applications, and that is quite attractive to many people. We have students, for example, from many different nations who come just to take part in this unique program. Our location is also quite unique. We have the world's oldest restored native plant community in Curtis Prairie at the Wisconsin Arboretum. Some say that this is proof that the science of restoration ecology was birthed in Wisconsin. Well, that may be oversimplified, but our reputation is strong. But students don't have to study prairies only. One student, Edmund Mukala, from the Congo, came to study restoring ancient wetlands in the Congo using knowledge gained from historic samples of the soil seed bank. Not all the seeds survived, but some can remain dormant for many years. Mr. Mukala wanted to find out what type of community would be most similar to that ancient seed bank. He has recently returned to the Congo and is now cooperating with the government to implement his findings. Now look at questions 36 to 40. As the talk continues, answer questions 36 to 40. So the only prerequisite for doing research here is that it is a native plant community. That means not just prairies, but wetlands, woodlands, savannas, and other environments. We're proud of the diversity of research topics in our program. And we continue to grow. This year we have 32 new students from eight different countries. When students first arrive, they begin rigid coursework in statistics, ecology, plant identification, and the theory of landscape change. Then they take part in internships at local conservation agencies such as the Arboretum, the Nature Conservancy, the Parks Department, and others. We find internships to be crucial in helping students apply the knowledge they have gained in the classroom. And we're proud to say that, since the beginning, we have graduated 277 students with master degrees from our programs and 122 students with PhDs. Some have gone on to bigger and better things. One graduate is now the director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in China. Another is the director of parks development in California. And others now lead their own research departments in universities around the world. That is the end of part four.